Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Building an Effective Front-End Testing Discipline with Front-End Engineering Consultant, Kevin Lamping. We're very excited to have Kevin do this session with us today because he is the expert on front-end testing and a leading front-end engineering consultant. Kevin helps Fortune 500 companies improve their overall testing processes, including implement, implementing test automation frameworks, building robust and scalable test suites, and establishing best practices and procedures that ensure a solid cross-team collaboration between QA and development. All that in order to accelerate go-to-market while delivering superior software. In addition, Kevin is the founder of Learn WebDriver IO and has his own YouTube tutorial channel, Front End Testing with Kevin Lemping. So I do suggest I let Kevin do the talking from now on. So Kevin, the stage is yours. Great. Um, welcome to this presentation. Uh, I, as Addy explained, I am Kevin Lamping. I do front end engineering, and I've also been getting really into testing lately um, for the past three or four years and have really enjoyed it. So let's go ahead and kick things off. Today, we are going to be talking about four uh, main topics. Uh, why are front-end devs suffering? Uh, we're going to go through that. It's going to be fun to, to hear the pains that we have. Um, and then what tools are out there to ease some of the pain? Um, how you can build a front-end testing discipline? And then finally, we'll round things out with tips for a happier workplace, how we can all work together uh, a little bit better. So I have a problem. So uh, I've got lots of problems, actually. And one of them is the magical IE6. Actually, no, not IE6. Thankfully, I don't have to deal with that browser anymore. I did have to deal with that browser 10 years ago. But um, fortunately, it has come and gone. And I no longer have to worry about the weirdest bugs that you could ever imagine um, from that browser. No, instead, I get to deal with at least five different browsers now. Um, Edge, the predecessor to uh, IE6, is out there. But I also have Chrome, Opera, Firefox, Safari, and every version of those in mobile form as well. Um, I also have to deal with many different responsive websites. And I say I have to deal. I mean, front-end devs, testers, everybody who works on the web has um, this fun chore or this fun task. And uh, so I've got my five different browsers and I've got you know at least six different screen sizes. You've got your horizontal, your landscape and your portrait and on all these different devices. Um, and then let's talk about operating systems. We've got Windows, we've got Mac, we've got Android, iOS, all sorts of things. And normally you don't get too many problems with operating systems, but you know something as simple as a font being loaded on one operating system but not on the other can actually cause a lot of trouble um, if it's a different size and things like that. And then um, even further down the line, uh, we've got many different ways uh, of user um, experiences. So let's talk accessibility. Um, at least 20% of users to your site have one form of disability or another. And so you have to be able to adapt to that. Um, dyslexia, blindness, visual impairment, physical impairments, things like that. So we need to make sure our websites work with that. How about spotty internet connections? Um, you have a, a website that loads a lot of data. And if you have a spotty internet connection, it can cause a lot of troubles there. Um, ad blockers are becoming increasingly uh, popular. And that's certainly um, something that we have to be aware of when we're developing a site, um, especially on the front end. If, if this ad doesn't get loaded or if this resource doesn't get loaded, um, you know, how is that going to impact the site? Same thing with privacy and then corporate firewalls as well. So when you try to visit the site at your place of work, what gets blocked, what resources get blocked, and are we relying on that and what happens if um, that's the case? So let's put all this together. We've got five different browsers at least, plus the six screen sizes of those browsers that you run on many different uh, operating systems and an infinite number of edge cases to work with. Well, this creates a lot of complexity and a lot of variation in how we're doing our testing. 
and all of this is just part of the front end that's this is kind of what's going on here so um, the magnitude of possibilities when making a website and and the different uh, people you're serving is uh, very very great but that's not the least of my problems and that's not the end of my problems I also have other problems and this has to do with how we design websites or um, create the styles for them so when I have a website and um, I want to style the title uh, the about us title it's not just styling that title it's also styling the other pages that's the way CSS works it's not scoped to a single page although you can do that a lot of times it's built around um, the entire site. So if I wanted to come in and change this about us title on my page, it's actually, if I'm not careful, it could um, certainly impact the other pages. And now I have the home page that has uh, an orange title and the contact us page has an orange title, um, even though I didn't intend for that. So just the way that CSS is built, um, it's uh, can be a, a struggle to work with if you don't understand how um, things play together. And so there is this uh, very popular GIF out there of uh, uh, Peter Griffin from um, Family Guy trying to get the blinds to work. And this is CSS in a nutshell. You change one thing and it breaks a, another and uh, eventually you just lose your mind and um, destroy it. So there's even more problems coming down the road for the front end, um, and this has become very apparent the past few years. Um, if we look back at like early 2000s, this is kind of your basic overview of how a website was built. You had a static front end built in HTML, maybe using tables for your layout. Maybe if you were one of the cool kids, you were using CSS at the time to use it to make the layout, but it was very static. You had five, 10 pages, um, an about us page, you know, nothing, nothing too much going on, just really presenting information. And then you had, um, and all of that was part of the front end. Everything else was the server side, and then the the real programmers took care of that. You know, they they put together the view logic that says when somebody goes to this URL, show this HTML. Um, the business logic saying when somebody submits this form, do this thing, and then you had your your data layer at the bottom, a database. And um, that's kind of the basics of it. So while we did have to deal with uh, IE6 and all that, it wasn't too complex. It was a, a pretty static website that we were working on. And then in the late 2000s, we started adding a little bit more functionality. We made our website dynamic um, with the advent of jQuery coming in. It made it really easy to add a little bit of jazz to our site. We could um, throw in tabs and accordions and mobile windows and form validation and so it, it got things a little bit more complicated on the front end but it wasn't too terrible then in the early 2010s um, we started seeing new javascript frameworks pop up things like knockout js and backbone js and what these did they they kind of jumped into that view logic so the part that created the html so if you think about like a to-do app um, an app that lists all your to-dos for the day so i want to go to do this and this um, if you had to refresh the page every single time you crossed off an item from your list that wouldn't be a great experience and so um, websites started having javascript handle that and so when i cross off an item from my list um, it doesn't refresh the page it just um, updates the HTML or the CSS, and then behind the scenes, it sends that information to the business logic. Um, and it, it made for a more responsive website, a, a website that uh, was easier for the user to interact with. It didn't take quite as much time. But there's this, there was this fuzzy division between the server side log view logic and the front end view logic. And it was this uncomfortable bit because you'd have the same HTML code that um, you would use for showing off that an item is complete. You'd have that on the front end and on the server side. And it was like this duplication of code that we, it, it just caused kind of maintenance issues, maintenance hassles, things like that. And uh, so we updated and we, we uh, evolved 
um, to introduce uh, JavaScript frameworks like Angular, React, Vue.js. And now we have a fully interactive UI. All of the view logic is stored on the front end. So nothing, um, nothing on the server side actually deals with how to build out the HTML. And because of this, we need like this temporary data store to say, okay, the user has done these actions and here's um, the data for all those actions and everything. So it's, it's not a persistent or um, long-term storage, but it's kind of a, a temporary storage, but we still need to handle it. Um, the business logic and the persistent data still lives on the server side, but um, you, know, you see how much more complex the front end has become in this instance. And you, know, you see that because web apps, they just dominate the landscape out there as far as websites go. Um, if you're not building a web app, um, then you know, you're, I guess, late to the game or something. Um, but not only that, from the UI perspective, we've started adding complex animations, designs that are just beautiful, but are very detailed and require a lot of uh, fo uh, attention to detail and uh, dynamic effects. You see when you scroll down a page and the background kind of has some uh, really interesting effect to it. It changes colors and things like that. You know, that's not necessarily JavaScript, but it is still part of the front end. And then uh, also with the rise, <clears throat> excuse me, with the rise of web apps, uh, sites have become focused around user content. So it's no longer, okay, here's the content that we're going to have on our page and we're going to test for that. It's here's content A, B, C, D, all the way down to Z, uh, different variations that we can have on the page. Uh, something can be one line or it can be two lines or it can be a photo or it can be a video or it can be just plain text, all sorts of stuff that we have to, to deal with. And then looking ahead, we've got um, applications like Electron and React Native that allow you to develop um, almost standalone apps that either run on the, um, you know, like like a mobile app. It will run on the person's phone. Instead of them having to go to a website, they actually run the app. And so now we've got these front end interfaces that have almost all of the functionality on their side. Um, so I, I have just barely scratched the surface with that as far as my experience goes. Um, but uh, I, I definitely see it being a big part of testing in the future, especially around the front end. And the problems still don't end. Um, you know, back in the, the early days of the web, we were focused about uh, around building these pages. Everything was about building a page. But nowadays, it's more about building puzzle pieces that we can put together to make a page. So I want to build a navigation element. I want to build a popover element. And then I'm going to have a team come in and put those pieces together to make the page. And I'm going to have 500 different variations of this because each uh, page needs to have its own little um, variation. And so uh, how is that going to interact? And I need to test all those variations. Um, this is especially true at very large companies that um, you have like a team dedicated to making the components and then all the other teams outside of it building in to uh, make them work. So um, now you're not um, now you're building one component that has many use cases and you have many individuals, but a single code base and it, it can get pretty complicated there. So with all that said, uh, I want to reemphasize why I believe in front end testing, and that's because, we have just this wide variety of supported devices that we want to um, have our website work on. So mobile phones, you know, that, that whole array. Um, we have a much greater uh, reliability or reliance on the functionality of the front end to do the work for us. So we're not always going back to the server nowadays. A lot of the, the, the value of a website comes from the front end now, instead of just being as, um, presentation layer, it actually is this full interaction layer. Uh, performance and usability definitely pay off. Um, there have been studies done that showed that conversions were 27% higher for visitors who enjoyed a load time that was one second faster. So by making 
their website one second faster to load, the conversion rate increased 27%. Um, that's a pretty pretty good business reason to have a, a good performing website. And the same thing goes for usability, um, making sure that people can can get use your site in a in an intelligent way. And I have to quick anecdote. I was trying to read a, a news article the other day, and it's there's this plain like <laughs> there was nothing fancy about the news article. It's just text. That's all I was there for. But of course, they had to load their video that kind of summarizes it, or uh, maybe it's like a related video because apparently videos get you more engaged or something. I didn't care for the video because I just wanted to read the news article. That's why I came there. And then they had to load even I, I use an ad blocker myself and kind of a privacy blocker myself, but they still loaded so much content, so many, so much JavaScript on the page. It was going to crash my browser. My laptop fan started spinning up and all that kind of stuff. And all this just for a news article, it, it just it boggles my mind that uh, this is how it's built. So um, on that note of loading so many scripts, like we have the front end has a very high utilization of third party code. Um, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So if there's this company that handles like the little chat box, making sure that, hey, um, if you need any help, you can get it. Well, I don't want to have to build all that functionality myself. I'm going to find this company that's done a great job with it and I'm going to integrate them in. But then I also need like my analytics. I don't want to write my own analytics software. So I'm going to have another company that I integrate that in and maybe um, some video loading. Uh, that's another third party code. So we have all these uh, different third party pieces kind of coming together and you have to make sure they all play together. So very complex landscape, um, all within the front end. And so um, that's why I really believe in front end testing. Okay, so um, that's my case for front end testing. What is my magical toolbox look like? Well, if I had a wish list, um, this is kind of what it would look like. I'd want a uh, the availability of a ton of devices to test on. I um, I can certainly run it on my personal laptop, but that's not what the majority of the users out there are going to have. Um, because I do a lot of dev work, I want a really quick and, and powerful laptop, but um, not a lot of users have that. Um, a lot of them either go for uh, budget conscience, so they have to have uh, lower performance, or they want um, mobility with it. So like the the MacBook Air, is a it's a great laptop, but it's also a little bit underpowered in some instances. So um, I need to be able to test on all these things. And then I want test suites that are useful for one. They actually test valuable things. They don't just go to a page and say, okay, here's the title of the page. Um, I want it to actually test good parts of it. And then resilient. So they're not going to break after a single change, even um, if that change was expected. I don't want them breaking. Basically, I need to have my junior developers be able to more confidently contribute code without inadvertently introducing uh, test issues or, or functionality issues. And so that's where this hope for reliant and useful test suites come from. And then I also, I'm also really big on consistent test environments. Nothing is worse than getting to uh, the testing phase of whatever I'm working on and the development server doesn't work. It's just broken. And you're just kind of sitting there going, I can't do anything because this server is down and, I don't know how to run it. So um, I'm basically just going to sit here and wait. And there's nothing else I can do. And then finally, um, along kind of that line, it'd be great if I could configure the test data myself because, you know, we have this wider range of users. Some users are like if you're looking at testing a blog, um, you have users who are uh, admins or editors, you know, a, a whole array of that. I want to be able to easily handle those different type of users. So that's my wish list. And with that, I'm gonna get into several um, different areas that we can test on the front end and kind of some solutions to that. So the first one we're gonna talk about is device testing. Like I mentioned, it's a, a big um, item on my wish list is having devices to test on. So, you know, we need this because it's 
you, you want to quickly and easily test your functionality across devices. If it takes too long, you're not going to do it. And if you don't do it, you're going to get bitten by a bug. It's, it's going to happen. So the traditional approach has been physical devices in the office. So when I was uh, in early on in my career, um, we actually had like uh, we were developing on a, on a Windows machine and then we had a Mac, uh, a Mac in the office that we would go to to check to make sure it works on um, the, the Mac browser and everything. And so a lot of things that would be fonts and, and CSS issues. And that worked pretty well for the time because that was it. You had your Windows and Mac and the different browsers on there. But um, since the mobile revolution, that's completely changed. And you've got hundreds of phones out there to, to test on. You've got many more browsers than we used to have. And so um, today, you know, having a physical device lab, it's uh, it is a bit of trouble. And so, if you're a small company, it's just going to be it's going to be too difficult to maintain extra effort to get everything loaded on. So, um, what type of front end friendly solutions do we have out there? Well, there's uh, many companies out there that offer virtual devices. So you can go to them and um, see all the different devices that you can test on. And I'm going to show you Sauce Labs real quick. This is one of those companies. Um, I've used them in the past many times. And looking at their devices, you can see they've got 359 right here of mobile devices. So if I need, if I have a bug report that it is broken on the HTC Nexus 9, and you know, I don't have to go over to my device lab and realize, okay, we don't have this. Okay, now we need to order it and all that. I just start up this virtual device and um, in some instance, they have um, real devices hooked in and I can test on there. So, you know, this wide array and that's um, extremely helpful for me to uh, do quick and easy testing and it's all hooked into my local computer. So even if it's uh, a local server that I'm running, um, Sauce Labs is in, and Browser Stack and all these solutions are intelligent enough to, to work with that. If you do use physical devices, which isn't a terrible idea, um, I recommend a tool called Browser Sync. And the way that Browser Sync works, let me get it out of here, is basically it synchronizes different browsers. So they have um, an animation here that looks like it stopped animating. Let's see if I refresh the page if they show it. Well, that's weird. Let's open this. There we go. I'll just open the image. So uh, you'll have like your main screen that you're working on. And then when you scroll down or take an action on that main screen, it reflects that action on the other device or browser that you're using. So that is a really helpful tool. Um, I believe it's completely open source, um, completely free to use. Uh, it's a great tool for quickly validating that your content works across a wide range, uh, a wide range of devices. And so um, I highly recommend checking out Browser Sync. Okay, next up on our list of uh, magical um, software, um, visual testing. Visual testing is a, a big part of today's web because, um, you know, dealing with um, looking back, you you would have maybe one or two bugs here, but just with how complex designs have become, how uh, complex websites have become, there's so many different components. Visual issues can still be big issues. So let's take a login button, for example. If you make a, a change and inadvertently the login button collapses, so the text is there, but you can't really see it because the background of that button has collapsed, um, Technically, this is going to work. If I run my test automation, uh, my functional test automation, it's actually going to click that button. It's not going to be thrown off by the fact that you can't, that the button is hard to see. It's not looking for that. Um, and so this is where these visual issues can be really big, bug, uh, really big bugs. If that's like your buy now button, well, you're losing a lot of money because your users can't see it, even though your automation says that it works fine. So the traditional approach was, probably manually checking this, um, but it didn't work all that well because first off, humans were bad at noticing small little changes in, in visual um, input. 
you, there's plenty of studies on this and it's um, there's some there's some funny ones out there with um, they have somebody somebody asked somebody else for directions and then in the middle of it uh, two workers come by uh, walk between the two people and they switch out the person asking for directions and the person giving the answer doesn't notice that they're talking to a completely different person. It's so weird how our mind works in that instance, but this happens on websites too. You know, we're not watching for these really small changes, but they can add up over over time. And a lot of times in testing, we're fo we're focused on the functionality. Can I? Does this still work? We're not going to be paying attention to is the font the same? Is is it still the right font? Is it still the right font size? Has that changed? Um, things like that. So um, that can introduce what I like to call design drift, where the design slowly drifts to be completely different over time as code is changed because nobody is catching these small issues. So what is my solution to this, my friend and friendly solution? Um, it's automated screenshot comparison. So you take a screenshot before, um, kind of in your good state, and then you take a screenshot after you make your code change and you compare the tool. And I highly recommend Appla Tools for this. They're um, not only are they helping provide this webinar today, um, they're just a great tool for managing your screenshot comparisons. Um, I've used open source tools in the past. They're great for getting a quick demo going and they um, make a cool little presentation. But truthfully, I've been trying to, um, to make visual regression testing happen since 2013 and until Apple tools came along like it just it hasn't been possible because it's not just doing the screenshot comparison it's managing those screenshots over time it's not taking a screenshot of the entire page it's taking screenshots of just elements of the page it's being able to handle when your text changes but it's you don't care if the text changes you want to make sure the the content or the container is still good. So Apple Tools has just this great variety of functionality that is really essential for scaling up visual testing outside of uh, a small little demo project. So highly recommend them. Next up are pattern libraries. If um, you're not familiar with pattern libraries, they basically document the core design of a site. So you know you have your actual site, but your login page or your home page. It'll have some design elements on it, but it's not going to have everything. And so you you would want to um, traditionally you have the design team create a static style guide that's usually a PDF. So at the end of the design phase, they say, okay, here are all the colors we're going to use. Here are all the the widths and the height and the padding and the spacing between all the different elements and the font size and the font we're using. And this is it never going to change ever, um, that's it. And so they upload it to like a, a server and it sits there. Somebody uses it once in a while, but it goes out of date really quickly because then uh, somebody comes back and they say, well, I don't want the font size. Somebody's having trouble reading the font size at that size, let's change that. And that doesn't get updated in the PDF and then it goes out of date. And it's not actually reflecting the actual implementation of the code. And some front-end developers are very good about um, quote-unquote pixel-perfect design. So they make sure that everything matches up just perfectly with how the original design was made. And other front-end devs aren't so good at that. Um, they kind of say, okay, it mostly resembles what it should look like, so we're just gonna go with that. Well, that means that this uh, beautiful static style guide isn't a representation of what the site actually looks like. So for me, I love using uh, these living style guides that are online. Um, you build them in as you're building out your website. You're building this style guide as well. And let's uh, there's this uh, two bits of software that I would recommend: Storybook JS. Um, I haven't used it too much, but from what I've seen of it, it looks really cool. Um, and then StyleGuides.io is a great repository of um, different style guides. So here we have, this is the style guides IO website. They show all these different pattern libraries. So if we look at the MailChimp pattern library, 
um, we go there, you see they talk about the grid sizes, you can get into components. As I mentioned, we, we're building components now instead of pages. Um, so they have actual code, they have an actual example. So I can click and it jumps me down. Here's some tabs. So actual working examples. This is super helpful when it comes to testing because you say, um, <clears throat> I wanna test how this component looks and how it works. I don't care about the server side of things. It doesn't actually have, uh, it's not actually connected to the server, but um, that's really good at isolating it and making it a lot easier to test. So um, that is a, a example style guide. And they actually have um, many tools that you can go into building your own style guide and things like that. Um, highly recommend that website. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Next up on my wish list of tools is, is this idea of mock APIs. If you're not familiar with what an API is, um, it, Early in the presentation, I mentioned this view logic and this business logic and how those two are now, the view logic is now on the um, front end and the business logic is on the server side. Um, and so uh, that the server side has morphed from this server returning HTML. Now we have a server that returns just data. Um, usually that's in the form of JSON. Uh, it's, a, it's a format for sending data and managing data. And uh, it's pretty common out there. And so that's what an API is. It's a, um, I wish I could remember what the acronym is, but um, it's a way of um, sending data to a server and getting data from a server completely outside of HTML and CSS and all the front end stuff. So uh, mock APIs are like servers, except they're um, they're kind of dumb <laughs> in that they don't actually do any sort of functionality. They don't have any business logic. They just say, "Okay, you wanted some data. Here's some data." It, you know, it's it's a. I'll, I'll I'll show an example in just a second. But the the point of it is we want quicker and more reliable testing. And so uh, normally what we would do is, and I've done this in the past, we'd get a full server running on the developer's computer and they would use that. So if I want to create some test data, um, I have the server running on my computer, I can go in and update the database myself, things like that. But that was really complex and it was prone to error. Anytime the code gets updated, now I have to update. And normally the server code is written in a language that I'm not familiar with. Um, you know, the, the server side devs handle that and I'm not a server side dev. And so I can try to understand it, but I'm probably not going to. So I need a lot of hand holding. Anytime um, there's the dependency update or a, database, or a database gets changed, I have to change it on my side. And if you take a week off of work, you're really gonna be, you're gonna spend the next two days trying to get your, your local server running again. And I, I speak from experience about this. It was very painful. So as, a, as an alternative to that is the mock API. And this is just a, I like to call it a black box of data. I don't care what goes on inside the server. All I know is I want this data. I want it to look like this. And um, there's a tool out there called Knock.js that I've used many times in the past. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So here's the code. It's written in Node.js. So this is JavaScript that runs on your local computer. So you'll load knock and then you'll define, um, okay, here's the URL that I'm expecting um, a request to come from. So I'm expecting a browser or something to say, hey, I wanna load this URL. Here's, uh, it's called an endpoint. So it's just an extra part of the URL. So you can imagine the URL is iriscouch.com slash users slash one. Okay, so anytime that there's a request that goes to that URL, go ahead and reply with this data. So it's gonna have a, a username, an email, an ID. So this, anytime the, uh, a person goes to here, they're gonna get this data back. It's very static. Um, it's not gonna change. Um, there are some kind of more complicated scenarios you can get into 
if they send certain data, then I can respond with a, a, a kind of a unique thing. But the basic idea is the same, is we're uh, mocking out uh, a fake server so that what's great about this, it makes our testing very reliable, uh, makes it something that we can say that we, we know um, what we're expecting back. And so um, now we can do assertions on that so we can uh, make sure that uh, the content is what we were expecting it to be. Um, it's a lot easier to run. You don't have to worry about updating your server code all the time. Um, it's basically kind of faking it all out. And so it only needs to be updated if the API changes. So that means if the data response coming back is in a different format now, like say they change the format to be something better based off of feedback, um, then we'd need to change it. But otherwise, we don't care about code changes if the, the format doesn't change at all. You can create a bunch of different scenarios. And um, another great part of this is you have data stored in your tests so that it makes your tests um, more um, maintainable. You don't have to run like a database script or anything to get things set up and, or manually set it up, set up all the data. It's uh, all done inside the code itself. So I uh, highly recommend mock APIs if you're interested in that. Along those lines, we can use mock APIs for functional testing. So it's functional testing, I, um, also known as UI testing. Uh, some people call it end-to-end -end testing. I personally prefer UI testing because that's what you're testing. You're testing the user interaction. Can a user open a browser, click on a button, enter some text, hit submit, more importantly, hit buy now, can they do that? So the point of functional testing is to reduce the reliance on manual testing. And this is automated functional testing, I should say. The traditional approach um, that I've seen in the past is a Java-based Selenium um, solution. The trouble with that is front-end developers aren't very familiar with Java. It's just they, um, they work in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and um, so they look at something that requires getting Java set up and it's just uh, a bit too much when the deadlines are already coming at you. So, uh, and then it also has a, a pretty verbose language and um, can be very complex to set up. Uh, so my solution to that, there's two, two tools that I would recommend. The first is called WebDriver IO. Um, it is a um, kind of a next gen WebDriver test framework. You can use it with Selenium. You can use it with just plain WebDriver. Um, if you wanna see an example of that, we've got an example right here. So this is our test. We're gonna load the WebDriver IO homepage. We're gonna go to the API URL. We're going to set the value to get T in our search input. Um, and then we're gonna go through our results and check if they're visible. We're going to get the results and check that they're a certain length. And then we're gonna click on an element and make sure that the text of that element is equal to this other thing. So it's a, a very concise, clean code base. You notice there isn't any um, um, like capabilities in here. If you've ever used Selenium in the past, you have to define your capabilities. That's all handled in a single configuration file that you can share across all your tests. So it's really great for that. Um, and most important to me is this is a code syntax that front-end developers are familiar with. Um, if you didn't notice this, this is a CSS selector. It's something that front-end developers are gonna identify with really quickly. Um, this dollar sign is another kind of, um, it's kind of a legacy from jQuery that front-end developers are gonna understand. It's using JavaScript code like filter and things like that. It's um, the describe and it, those are part of the Mocha framework. Mocha is a tool that uh, we'll talk about in just a second, used for unit testing. So it's uh, got a really good connection with front-end developers. And um, it actually was the tool that really got me interested in front-end testing from a functional standpoint. There's another alternative out there that's uh, called Cypress IO. They're doing a great job with the tool. Um, their big thing is that they have dependency-free testing. So they don't use Selenium, they don't use WebDriver. Um, they kind of run things themselves and um, they, they're kind of a all-in-one solution. So it's really great if you wanna get things started. 
Um, I'm going to throw a quick um, plug in here for my course on WebDriver IO. If you go to learn.webdriver.io, um, you'll see I've got about 50 tutorials I worked on for um, about, I spent about a year and a half building these videos out. So um, I've uh, really enjoyed that and I wanted to mention it if you are interested in WebDriver IO. I will have a coupon at the end for 20% off. So um, if you're going to look at that, uh, wait to see the coupon. Okay, uh, unit testing. I, I did mention unit testing just a second ago. Um, this is something that's definitely increased in popularity lately. Um, and you you use it to catch bugs during development. The traditional approach here is uh, kind of uh, 10 years ago, we actually didn't really do a lot of unit testing on the front end. Um, so a lot of what was introduced came from standard practices of like this red green testing you would have code, you'd write a unit test, it would break, and then you would write the functionality for it. Um, that's a pretty good practice. I don't use it too often, but there are definitely instances where I do like to use it. But the trouble is um, front end code is built around user interactions. So it's not always this simple input output. It's more the user clicked a button or they entered this text. And so, um, instead kind of from, from front end unit testing, I, I really want to preach the difference between unit and functional. There, they are different things. There are um, really good use cases for unit testing and really good use cases for functional testing. I do think you should have both, um, but you need to limit the use of each of them to what they're good at. Unit testing isn't always great at testing user interaction, say like if a user clicks a button or something, but it is great at this input output. I put content into a piece, a uh, piece of code and I expect this return. Um, it's great for that. There are several tools out there, Jest, Mocha, Jasmine. Um, I'll have links to all these at the end, but uh, I think the big thing is just teaching the difference between unit and UI testing um, and knowing that. Next up are, is accessibility testing. I mentioned about 20% of your users are going to have a disability. So, uh, we do this for legal reasons. Um, in certain instances, there are laws around making sure that your website is um, accessible, but also moral reasons. We don't want to keep people from using our website just because they have a disability. That's a pretty uh, mean thing to do. <laughs> so the traditional approach out there that I've seen is you, you run this quote unquote accessibility validator. Um, it'll check for things like images having alt attributes, but that's about it. It doesn't really get into the details of it, um, we outsource it to another company that promises to do it, and then you have this kind of disconnect between your front end devs and your dev team and this other company that's coming back with some normally bad news, or you ignore it. You say, okay, we want to do accessibility testing, but now it's not the right time. Uh, unfortunately, that happens a lot. And the problem with a lot of this is those validators aren't going to catch all the errors. Um, you simply can't run a validator that catches all accessibility issues. It's not going to happen. It's, that's just the complexity of, um, of accessibility testing. Um, it also overemphasizes compliance over user uh, functionality. Um, okay, our, our site is accessible because it meets this checklist. No, the site is accessible because we have actual users who can use the site, um, users with disabilities. And another problem is that it's often too late. We wait to do accessibility testing until the very end, and then we can't change the things that need to be changed. So I would recommend um, instead to have some honest automated tools. The ACTS accessibility engine is really great at giving you a good overview of um, what you need to, to fix. Uh, but that tool is, it's very honest. It says it's not gonna check for everything. And some of these um, errors aren't really errors. They're just something to be pay attention to and take a look at. Um, also, you're gonna need to do training and hands-on manual testing. There's this uh, cool little rally. It's called the um, Accessibility Initiative Rally, I believe. And teams will get together and try and build an accessible website for a nonprofit. I think it's coming up um, in the next couple months if you want to check that out. But it's a great experience to learn more about testing or accessibility testing and kind of understand what users are going through. So that's my list of um, tools. Uh, bear with me for a second. I'm going to get a drink of my tea.
Okay, so those are the tools and everything. Um, those are great, but that's only half the battle. The other half is actually making it happen. And that was an important part of this um, presentation for me is how do I actually take all this list of tools and implement them and everything to actually do good front end testing? And it's, it's difficult, but um, these steps here are kind of a, a, um, a base to build off of. So I think start off, put together a plan, establish a communication between yourself and the front end team or yourself and the QA team. Uh, whichever side you're on, um, or yourself and your manager or anything like that. And then after a while, you're going to want to revisit and revise. And then finally, at the end, I'll, I'll throw out an idea about creating a test dashboard that I think isn't quite necessary to be successful, but it certainly helps. So let's talk about planning ahead. Um, the biggest issue that I see coming out of people trying to plan for that is they have these grandiose plans of, okay, we're gonna do performance testing and unit testing and functional testing, and accessibility testing and yada, yada, yada. It's not gonna happen all in one go. It's, it's a really complex area that you're trying to test. And so start small, focus on one thing. And as far as what to focus on, that's where you wanna understand your team motivations. Know what's important to different members of your team. Um, if you've got somebody who is really passionate about the performance of the website, pull them in and say, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to start by tackling performance. And I know you're really interested in this. So if you want to help with that, that'd be awesome. Um, and so this kind of provides the most value out of the gate. It gets people um, um, interacting with you and, and part of the process. And so it's a, a great starting point to kind of kick things off. Secondly, um, you're going to want to build vertically and then horizontally. So here I have an image of, uh, like say you wanna write uh, UI tests. Well, don't focus on writing just the UI test. Focus how, on how those UI tests integrate with the entire um, code lifecycle. So we want a test reporter to show that, um, to show to our manager to say, okay, here's the test, here's how, how they ran. They're not gonna be too interested in the code, but they are gonna be interested in what the code showed. And then you also want to integrate it into your code repo. You'll have your test server and your test runner and all that kind of stuff. So what I would recommend is build maybe one single test, like a login test, and then build all the structure around it before you start adding your sign-up tests, your homepage tests, and all those other tests. Having a large suite of tests that barely get run isn't useful. <laughs> and um, having a single test that's very visible to people, to managers especially, um, it's gonna be really useful because it's gonna show all your effort and it's gonna keep testing in the forefront of their mind. So um, that's what I recommend for planning ahead. Again, start small and then build a vertical slice instead of just doing a single layer kind of thing. Um, as far as establishing communication, so you have a, this plan ahead, you're gonna wanna keep checking in with um, the team and make sure that things are progressing as expected. An important part of this, review the upcoming development work to make sure that you're not writing tests for code that's gonna come out of date, um, that you're writing tests for code that is actually changing, not code that's just sitting over there in its corner getting dusty. Um, you know, Maybe that's not the most important thing to test at this point in time. Um, but also you don't wanna write tests, like especially with functional tests, um, you don't want to, the functional tests rely on um, selectors like uh, HTML selectors to get to certain elements on the page. If, that, if those HTML elements are gonna be changing a lot, like if it's a, a new page being developed, you might wanna hold off on the functional testing at the moment because you're gonna end up having to rewrite a lot of your tests. So um, it's really important to know what's coming uh, down the pipeline. Um, also, share your task list, not just to say, hey, these are all the things I'm working on, isn't that great? But to say, hey, these are things that I could use a lot of help with, or I could use some help with. And a lot of front-end developers that I know, I'd say at least half of them, are interested in writing test automation. They're interested in seeing how the site performs and, and setting that up. Um, not everyone out there, so it's not gonna be something for everybody, but um, share your task list and, and show people what you're working on and see if they wanna, join in and help out. 
And then finally, just make sure you're talking on a regular basis, whether this is meeting for coffee once a week or every two weeks or having a formal meeting as well. Um, just make sure you're, you're doing it on a regular basis. And then as you're going along and you're, you're building out your test suite, um, you need to revisit and revise because companies change, companies' priorities changes, project priority changes, things like that. So you wanna look back and say, um, how has my automation helped? Where has it had a lot of impact? Um, there, like has it been performance? Have we done a really great job? Well, what are some other things that we can do to test performance? Um, or what pains are we running into? What friction in the process of testing do we have? Say you're doing a login test and you need different users. Well, if every time the test server gets updated, you have to recreate those, those users, that's a big friction. That's something that's gonna hold the, the test from being actually automated. So focus on places that we weren't quite expecting it, but uh, where these pains rise up. And then, um, you know, I mentioned that company's priorities um, shift. Maybe we're focused on this product this week, but next week they've uh, changed plans. You know, something happened in the market and they need to make sure that they are able to do this. Well, maybe we need to push those plans that we had laid out off because things shifted. So it's it's important to revise your plan and not just keep going down the same path because ultimately testing is something that's it doesn't have um, so much an inherent value, like nobody's coming to your website to run your test. They're coming to your website to use your website. So if you have tests that are running but not actually testing anything valuable, um, they're not gonna be valuable themselves, which is, it's just the, the nature of the game. So uh, make sure what you're testing is the, the value of your business. And then I wanna close off this section by talking about building a testing dashboard. So this is something that it's not like a source of data, it's just a, a kind of this hub pointing the way to all the different sources of data out there. So it'll link to your bug and issue tracking, a task board that has all your the list of tasks that you're working on, your automated test results for your UI testing, your performance testing, so that managers can come in and click a link and okay, so this was the latest run of tests. I see that we've got a test failing. Okay, now I have something to talk about uh, during staff meeting or whatever. And then your static pages in your documentation. If you have a style guide set up, um, link to it. If you've got documentation on how to run tests or where, you know, um, how to run performance metrics or even like your, your goals that you set, um, have links to that. And I would definitely lean on your developers for building and organizing it. If there isn't like a wiki that you can use to build this out, um, have your devs help out. They'll probably have a lot of fun with that, especially if you get them on either one of these dashboards. Um, they're really interactive and pretty and fun to look at and play around with. So um, check those out. So I'm gonna finish up this presentation by talking about some tips for teaming up between QA and the front end. Um, and what I, what a kind of just personal experience and um, what I think are useful. So uh, the first one is don't be late to the party. Don't um, I know it can, uh, normally the QA team doesn't intend to do this, but like project managers, they'll say, okay, well, we're gonna need to test our site and we can't test the site until it's built. So testing goes at the very end. So that's when we'll bring in the testers. Um, that's, no, you, testing should be involved the entire way along. Um, the first part is defining testing goals. So what does a performant website actually look like? Um, is it something that loads in three seconds? Is it something that loads in five seconds? Is it a certain amount of data that we're loading? What's that actually gonna look like? Help define that. How are we gonna test accessibility? Are we gonna run a quick validator? Or are we gonna bring in actual users who have uh, disabilities? That's gonna take a little bit of time to set up. It's a great time to do that while the, the website is being built out. Um, you can also help in the beginning, raise awareness of how you can help. So um, say we want to this this website to work on mobile devices. Well, you can help say, oh, you know, I know how to set up some devices for testing. I've got an old iPad in my desk. Um, I can help set up and you wanna pair up on that? Or, um, you know, have you considered using a tool? I saw this presentation this guy gave and uh, he mentioned uh, browser sync. Have you heard of browser sync? You know, is that something that you'd be interested in? So kind of just, um, 
let people know that you're there to help along the way and it's not just something that they throw the website over the fence to you at the very end and you rush to get it done because of course they give it to you two weeks behind schedule and now the they want the project delivered at the same deadline so now your your timeline is shrunk down um, that's not fun for anybody so um, I highly encourage you to get in, um, interested from the start and I think most front-end devs and most development teams are going to uh, appreciate that coming in from the beginning. Um, when it comes to reporting bugs, this is a really important one to me is uh, being explicit with your bug reports. And I don't mean that this effing thing doesn't work, um, more being uh, explicit with the details. So um, you have a, um, a, okay, sorry. Here's a example. Uh, this is an actual example from the React code base of someone submitting a bug report and they, they have some details in there. You know, you think you understand what's going on, but there's so many uh, vagaries in here. A child component constructor is called multiple times when changing state. What child component? How is that set up? It's not, uh, they say that when they upgraded to React 16, this is happening. Well, what version were they on before? Maybe there was a, um, a change that happened along the way and um, it caused, uh, sorry, maybe something happened between 14 and 16 that didn't happen between 15 and 16. And so, um, you know, there's it's just a little bit too vague. And so this, this issue get, ends up getting closed because they just, there isn't a good example. Um, basically the maintainer would be stabbing in the dark trying to figure out what's going on when it could be any number of things. So instead, we have another, I found another example out there. Um, this is what I would consider a really good bug report. So we've got um, a guy saying, this is a bug, but uh, kind of annoyance. And then they do this TLDR, uh, which stands for too long, didn't read. Basically it gives a summary of um, what's going on, but then they actually get into the details. So um, you scroll down the page, They've got examples in the bug report. They have a link to an actual um, code that it's, it's happening on. They get into more details about all it. They have step-by-step -step instructions of what's going on. And then at the end, um, it's a little bit cut off at the bottom, but you know the, the same guy uh, responds with, hey, that's interesting. Can you help me out? Help me understand this a little bit more or something like that. So when you give your bug reports, it's important to talk about what device you were on, um, what page you're on, the specific items of the page that you took. Don't just say, I clicked it and the, the window didn't appear. Well, you clicked the login button and the modal window didn't, the modal window prompting a, a forgot password didn't appear or something like that. So be explicit about what actually happened. Talk about uh, what user were you using when you logged in. Sometimes users have different data and that can cause issues. What was the screen resolution? What did you eat for breakfast? Well, maybe not the what you ate for breakfast, but I don't know. I've dealt with many bugs and sometimes it seems what I ate for breakfast actually impacted what went on. But yeah, I think um, having screen recordings, those are also super great if you can get them in. Sometimes bugs kind of happen out of the middle of nowhere, so it can be trouble. But um, I would say uh, the more detail you can provide, the better. You don't have to do it all the time. You don't have to be this explicit all the time but um, it is something that may, brings joy to a developer's heart when they get a bug, you know, bad news, you have a bug on your site, but here's exactly how to reproduce it. It helps immensely. Another important part of the relationship is compromising. Um, if you are running tools and validators, understand they're not the absolute tool, uh, truth. That Axe validator, for example, can be incorrect sometimes because there's uh, some fuzziness around um, how accessibility is tested. And software can't always be perfect, there's gonna be bugs, so we're gonna have to kind of weigh how important it is to fix this bug before we release the, the code. Front-end developers and developers in general want their work to become public, it's just part of what motivates us. So being held back by this minor bug uh, can be really frustrating, and so I'm not saying always give in. Sometimes we push back when we really shouldn't because we're either being too lazy or we don't actually understand the issue. But sometimes we push back because we have a, a valid case. And I think just coming to a compromise on both sides is important. Um, and then from your end, uh, it's really important for you to question how 
things work. So um, get your developers thinking about the interactions. So this is uh, a great uh, tweet out there, kind of a joke. A QA engineer walks into a bar and orders a beer. And I'm actually going to stop right here because this is normally where the developer stops thinking. They say, okay, my requirement is I can have a, I have a QA engineer. They can walk into a bar and order a beer. Okay, I built the code for that. Great, it works. It's tested. Go release it. But the, the really value in the QA engineer is that they start thinking outside of what could happen. They order zero beers, they order a million beers, they order a lizard, which isn't a beer, and then they order negative one beers, which doesn't even make sense, and then they order something that doesn't actually exist. But what's great about this is it, it um, gets you thinking outside of those typical requirements and can really uh, improve the software. And so that's uh, a great value that you can bring as someone with this QA mindset of thinking outside that devs aren't always great about. Uh, me personally, I'm not always great about thinking outside of the box as far as that goes. And along with those lines, um, it, it's great if you can teach us how to test. Um, as simple as, hey, let me show you what I've got going on over here. Like say you wrote a little bit of UI automation, show them how, how it works, show them it running, and maybe that'll trigger uh, an interest in them and now they're helping you out. Um, or if you put something together, say I wrote some UI tests, it works on my my computer, but I wanna make sure it works on other computers. Do you mind trying to run it on your own? That might also get them um, interested in writing tests, things like that. How to identify meaningful edge cases. So not just every edge case out there, but ones that are actually valuable, um, that are actually gonna be representative of real life. And then also do lunch and learns. I've given many lunch and learns over my years. I highly recommend them. It's a great way to share knowledge throughout a company and um, managers love it because they, they see that you're sharing knowledge with other developers and helping other um, members of the team be um, better at their job. So highly recommend those as well. They can be super simple. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. Um, if you can if you can get your manager to pay for lunch, that's great. But otherwise, do uh, just say, hey, everybody go get lunch and then come meet at 1215. And I'll give you a short presentation talking about this tool kind of thing. So I recommend that. And then last, I would say learn a little programming. And I don't I really don't want this to be condescending. Um, I don't think everybody has to learn programming, but I, I do want to encourage you to learn a little bit. So there's a ton of great resources out here. This is Free Code Camp put together. Um, it's a series of tutorials and videos that go over some really cool um, technology out there. You don't have to worry so much about learning React.js unless you actually want to, but um, learn something like Node.js is really beneficial because a lot of the front end build tools are built around it. WebDriver IO is built around it. Browser Sync is built around it. So knowing how to work inside of Node.js or Git and GitHub, um, understanding JavaScript, it's it's a really beneficial skill set and it's gonna help a lot. And um, you can also pair up with a front-end developer, see if somebody wants to help you learn. Um, maybe meet 30 minutes every week to answer any questions that you have. That's a great experience and it can really build a good um, team camaraderie. Okay, so I promised a coupon at the end. Um, that's uh, Apple Tools 2018. That'll give you 20% off my course if you're interested in it. Um, again, that's just about WebDriver IO. I give some real life examples in there, everything like that. And um, that code is at the bottom here. And thank you all for um, joining me in this presentation. Feel free to email me. My email address is me at clamp.in. I've got the slides available at this bit.ly address. Do pay attention to capitalization, that does matter. Um, links to all the tools that I talked about and a couple other resources are available as well. Um, you can check out my YouTube channel at videos.clamp.in. And I'm going to go ahead and, uh, again, thank you for joining and opening up for questions. Great. So, Kevin, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that I know that we are out of time. We will take uh, a couple of questions, though. Um, so if you need to drop off, you can listen to the recording. The recording will be emailed to you by Monday. Uh, so I know we're at the top. We're well after the top of the hour, but you know, just a few questions. Um, and also, by the way, I saw a lot of people asking for a demo of automated visual testing. So uh, one, of, uh, one of our team uh, engineers will get back to you on that. That is not 
related to Kevin in any way, but uh, so so if you want uh, a demo for automated visual testing and definitely the people that asked for it, we will get back to you on that uh, later on after the session. Um, so Kevin, first question. Um, how do I test a component library that does not implement any JavaScript business logic for, say, a pagination component and only controls the markup and styles for the component? I need to assure consumers that these components will function within their React, Vue, or Angular application, given they've hooked up this pagination component correctly. I don't want to create a test app for each web framework uh, our consumers might use. Yeah, that's a, a great question, um, and certainly something that happens quite often. Especially, you know, I talked about the components being uh, a big part of building out websites. Now we are going to use this component across many different instances. Um, I would highly recommend uh, because it doesn't uh, interact with uh, the business logic. You probably separate it out into two different um, items. You have testing the component itself. So that I'd recommend visual testing highly because that's a big part of pagination. I could easily see a CSS change being made and now all of a sudden all those links are all on top of each other because the spacing got messed up. Um, so visual visual testing will catch that um, and use like your, the style guide that I mentioned for that, the static page that isn't hooked up to anything for that. You can also do a little bit of um, like WebDriver IO testing or Cypress IO testing where it goes in it clicks and clicks and make sure that the fake data works. And so that's gonna test um, kind of the core functionality of the code. And then you're also gonna have the other half of that, which is testing the actual implementation. Did the developer team use that component correctly? And um, you, know, you don't wanna have to rewrite that for every single um, um, instance that it's used. So in that in that scenario, I would recommend un, uh, learning, if you're not familiar with it, the concept of page objects. Um, I like, I'd like i prefer to call them component objects, but the basic idea is uh, in, in functional testing, you have um, kind of these utility functions that define how a page or a component is set up, and then you use that inside of your um, actual test suite itself. So you can have multiple test suites that use a single page object um, just in different ways. I, I rely on that method uh, quite heavily when I write my test because I don't want to have to write the same um, kind of interaction test again and again and again. I just want to make it like a, a quick one or two lines of code that I'm testing. Okay, here's the same component, but it's on this other page. I'm gonna run the same tests on it. Um, so yeah, uh, I highly recommend learning uh, about page objects. Next question. Kevin? Yes. Um, uh, great, so I'll, um, so next question. Um, this one is about uh, visual testing. Uh, mm -hmm. With Apple tools, uh, with different screen resolutions, you will have different screenshots. How can you manage handle slash handle that? Yes, definitely. And um, I think Apple Tools is great about this because they actually include the screen resolution as part of the screenshot itself or the screenshot information itself. So, um, you know, when I when I was working with open source tools, it would actually be part of the file name. And so I would have like the element that I'm taking a screenshot of or the page I'm taking a screenshot of and then the browser, the browser version, the operating system, the operating system version, the resolution. So I'd have these huge file names um, just to keep the, the image uh, name unique enough. And it was really difficult to manage. So that's, again, why I highly recommend a tool like Apple Tools because it takes that information for you and, um, organizes it in a much, much better way. If you go through their demo, you'll see where it shows the, the, the resolution. So when you're doing something like visual testing, you're gonna use a um, functional test framework. And in that framework, you're gonna be able to define what screen resolution you're, want, you're gonna test on. So when you do take your snapshot, it kind of gets that information gets sent to um, Apple tools to, to manage. 
So yeah, next question. Okay. Uh, great. So um, I think that this one will be our last, unfortunately, because we are severely out of time. Um, so next question. With the Universal Windows Platform apps, would you recommend front-end testing with various device sizes or not, since uh, UWP is expected to seamlessly scale the apps regardless of clients? Um, I actually haven't dealt with UWP at all, but I do recommend it. Um, as much as software likes to promise these perfect solutions that just work, the truth is they don't always work. Um, it's um, very difficult to build a system that's as resilient as it can scale to all the different device sizes, especially if you're talking about a mobile phone versus a tablet versus a desktop. Um, you just got to verify the the actual solution. So um, yeah, I, I do recommend that you do front end testing for the different um, device sizes and everything, just to verify that what they promised um, is actually what was delivered. Worst case, you end up spending a, a few extra cycles doing unnecessary testing, but chances are you're gonna catch something um, just knowing how it works uh, in, in the software world. Okay, so unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Actually, it's 14 minutes less than the time that we had for today. So I want to thank everyone that joined us for this live session and stayed a bit longer. And of course, I want to thank our speaker, Kevin Lamping. Uh, so please uh, check out his uh, website and his YouTube tutorial. Uh, you have that uh, here, the links in the, in the sli on the slide. And I'm just, I just want to remind you that the link to the recording uh, of this session will be emailed to you by Monday, and I hope to see you all at our next event.